Hey, welcome to our weekend show. And on this first weekend of a new American presidency, we look back at some earlier presidencies. No, not Lincoln, Coolidge and Kennedy, but the administrations of Jordan Lyman, Bill Mitchell and Andrew Shepard. Don't remember President Lyman, President Mitchell and President Shepard? You will. And the novelist Andrew Claven is here to talk about where our culture's headed during the Trump years. Oh, and we have a great Canadian song for you by the late Leonard Cohen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nah, not that Leonard Cohen song. The Klezmer Conservatory Band are going to crowd onto our little cabaret stage and blow the roof off this joint. But first... Donald J. Trump is now the 45th president of these United States. In the boring old real world, that is. On the big screen, we're way past 45 presidents and up into the hundreds. That's to say the fictional presidents uh, who've turned up in thrillers, comedies, romances, superhero movies, animated features and whatnot over the years. So I asked uh, Kyle Smith, uh, the New York Post's movie maestro, if he'd like to pick out a few favorite celluloid presidents uh, for our uh, entertainment this inaugural weekend. And, and you've started with uh, uh, one of my favorite presidents from one of my favorite presidential movies. Yeah, Seven Days in May was actually uh, a uh, political thriller about a right-wing military coup taking place uh, sort of under the nose of the president. And it was actually made at the behest, at the request of John F. Kennedy because he needed a, a propaganda win against the generals like... Uh, Edwin Walker, who was a John Bircher and was uh, getting a little too big for his britches, in Kennedy's opinion. At, at the time, nobody enjoyed more respect than generals. This is a, sort of still the right. post-war period, and Eisenhower is still very respected. Right, and just, just to be clear about this, uh, my memory is that this was released a, a few months after Kennedy was assassinated. Yeah, yeah. Kennedy made, uh, they, were, they were filming it in, I think, 63, and, and it came out in 64. Yeah, and so uh, although Kennedy was concerned about generals moving against him, in the end it was, uh, you know, a communist uh, who'd been in Russia and Cuba who, uh, <laughs> who wound up uh, t t taking him out. But the president here uh, is played by uh, the great Frederick March. Let's, let's take a look at him being particularly presidential. And we will see a day when on this earth all men will walk out of the long tunnels of tyranny into the bright sunshine of freedom. I hope to live long enough uh, to see a president who looks like <laughs> Frederick yeah. March in the Oval Office, because he does actually look presidential, doesn't he? He does. I think uh, March was kind of designed to not look like Kennedy. He's not young and glamorous. He's more of an Adlai Stevenson type. He's a grind. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning of the movie, we see him working so hard that uh, you know his, his doctors are concerned that he's going to work himself to death. And, Someone says, you know, when was your last vacation? He said, when I was six months old in oh. Cleveland, Ohio. Right. So it's sort of the very opposite of sort of a Kennedy sort of playboy figure who's young and vigorous and yeah. maybe not all that serious about the job. This guy's totally focused, dedicated to the job. Uh, he's, I don't think they ever say he's a Democrat, but he's clearly a Democrat. Uh, he's pushing for a, a nuclear arms uh, treaty, a sort of anti-arms yeah. treaty yeah. with the Russians, and the generals won't allow that because they think that would be suicide. You said uh, the assumption is... Uh, that Frederick March is a Democrat. And that's really the case with almost all these presidential movies, even going back to the early 60s, that the heroic president, even if it's never explicitly stated, is a Democrat. Oh, uh, absolutely. There, there's almost no real bipartisanship. Uh, even if they don't name the parties, they're definitely trying to push you toward a point of view that... Uh, you know, there's one party that wants to take money away from the homeless, and there's right. one party that wants, to, wants everyone to be happy and do nice things for people, and it's pretty clear what, what they're talking about. Yeah, let's, let's have a look at a very good example uh, of that, because uh, this is a film that came out in the 1990s called Dave. And who's Dave? Dave, played by Kevin Kline, uh, is an ordinary guy who is posing as the president because the actual president, who's mean and probably a Republican, and uh, wants to starve everyone to death and is very cynical and is yeah. cheating on his wife. 
he suffers a stroke during, let's say, an act of Congress with a uh, cute young staffer. Uh, he is incapacitated <laughs> yes. by the stroke, so the president's men, led by Frank Langella, who's the evil chief of staff, uh, take uh, a guy who's basically a celebrity impersonator who runs a temp agency, this ordinary guy who knows absolutely nothing about politics but has a big heart, and they plug him into the presidential role. The, the uh, plot, of course, is that this empty suit, cynical president, once you put nice Kevin Klein into, into that role uh, with a big heart, he starts wanting to use his powers for the good of the people. Let's, let's have a look at the clip here. Uh, okay, before we get started, uh, a couple things I'd like to go over in the budget. Do we have anything on the budget today? No, I don't think so. Now, I, uh, I think I found some ways to put back the homeless section of the Simpson-Garner Works Bill. Mr. President, I don't believe that's on your agenda today. No, it's a last minute change, Bob. Uh, that's a bit of a cliche in these uh, films now, the sinister chief of staff played by uh, yeah. Frank Langella. So if it Al, maybe an Al Haig type, I'm thinking? Yeah, yeah. Now, what I, you know, I have to say something about Dave, because I saw Dave when it came out, and it's basically a, an American version of The Prisoner of Zender. Uh, which, as you know, has been filmed multiple uh, times over the years, but a, a Prisoner's End in which uh, a, 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 an Englishman on vacation in Ruritania is prevailed to step in and uh, play the king at his coronation. And the premise of the story is that, uh, is that the stand-in makes a much better job at being king than the real, the real king does. But the difference is... Um, you know, when you, when you read The Prisoner of Zender, even today, even for all its sort of Victorian stodginess, it's about something primal. It's driven by the sense of uh, duty and honor. And uh, Princess Flavia uh, says to, the, uh, to Rudolf Rassendel, the Englishman, you know, honor binds a woman to uh, Rudolf, and that she has to act out of a sense of honor, a sense of this is why they have to th save the throne of Ruritania. And when you look at this, when you look at this modern version with Kevin Klein, Dave, uh, you know, there's no, nothing primal, there's no honor, there's uh, no duty, it's about an affordable housing bill. I mean, that's, there's not enough motoring the film there, is there? Yeah, I, I would say in all these movies, honor or thumos or the manly qualities have been replaced by a more feminine, caring quality. It's all about heart. Uh, it's, it's all about uh, your emotional appeals, your, your emotional connection to the voters. There's actually a scene, the one that precedes this, uh, where the, the phony president goes to a homeless shelter and he's, he's literally like talking to a small black child who's like, you know, he's putting, putting uh, you know, wisdom in his heart and he, he, and he realizes, oh, I can, I can use this, this weird situation I'm in to do great things for the American people and great things is defined as, you know, $650 million for uh, homeless programs, like, like the trillions of dollars they spent on, uh, on anti-poverty programs that have had any effect whatsoever. Right, right. But that's, that's what it would be, uh, you know, if uh, that's, what, that's what would happen today. If Donald Trump were to keel over from a stroke, they'd find a Trump impersonator, and the Trump impersonator uh, would be visiting a, a mosque to prepare to put them all on a Muslim registry, and he'd speak to the nice, big, full-bearded imam and realize he's just a friendly, cuddly guy and that he needs to have uh, outreach and bring peace to the Middle East. And that, it, they're, they're, the plots are essentially all the same on these things. But in a funny way, this is a very Trumpian movie because the suggestion is you don't need any policy chops whatsoever to be right. president. All you need is the right sort of instincts, the right gut, and you could just plug in, you just parachute into Washington, D.C., and shake up everything and do everything the right way. Only I'm, I'm sure you know, the yeah. liberal makers of this film had no idea that, that uh, anyone like Trump would ever come. I mean, he's literally the first president to have no military or government experience. Yeah, that's, tr that's true. In a sense, he is. Uh, well, wait a minute, wasn't, uh, what was Dave doing uh, when he was back? Was he working? He ran a temp agency. He was right. a total, total civilian. Yeah. Right, OK. So that's, that's not so very different from being in real estate or whatever, when you think of it, when you put it like that. He's a small businessman. <laughs> yeah. Let's, Frank Langella, um, who uh, he, he, years, years ago, he was appearing at a play in London, and uh, he, he was kind of bored and didn't have anything to do. So I used to, uh, for, for about a, whatever, it was like a three month period. I, I, uh, I, I had dinner with Frank Langella <laughs> two nights a week just because he, uh, uh, he didn't know a, a lot of people in, in town back then. But Frank Langella graduated uh, from playing 
uh, the sinister chief of staff in this movie to playing the supposed most sinister president of all time uh, with, uh, with uh, David Frost. Yeah, so Frost and Nixon was based on the play that won a lot of prizes on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, Michael Sheen plays David Frost, and it's a dramatized uh, series of events uh, uh, preceding and surrounding the, the famous uh, interviews they did. I think Nixon made a considerable packet, uh, essentially sold the right to interview him. This is his first interview after Watergate, and there's a scene, sort of the climactic scene, or, well, right before the climactic scene, uh, Nixon uh, gets drunk on whiskey and calls up Frost at night and starts sort of confessing to him a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that was really uh, why Frost's people uh, ponied up the money to pay Nixon for this interview. Frost was expected to deliver, uh, by the end of the final interview, something new and confessional mm -hmm. uh, from this disgraced president who'd been forced out of office. Yeah, and he, he does get that. The, the, the very climactic scene, the peak of the movie, is uh, when Nixon says, if the president does it, it's not illegal. If you look at the transcript when he said that, it looks, it looks not quite as bad on paper as it looks in the movie. In the movie, it looks really, really bad, like, yeah, like yeah. Frost has won. This is the knockout blow. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's very dramatically rendered by Ron Howard, the director. And, uh, and Howard actually had a, a made-up scene before that where Nixon gets drunk. Yeah, let's have, a, let's have a look at that. Did the snobs there? Look down on you, too? <laughs> of course I did. That's our tragedy, isn't it, Mr. Frost? No matter how high we get, they still look down at us. Who's that playing uh, Frosty that's, there? That's Michael Sheen. So Nixon's trying to make a connection between yeah. them. He was kind of a scholarship boy growing up, a little, a little clever, but not, uh, not very high class. Nixon, of course, was uh, a working class president who came from, you know, sort of nowhere, right. California, did not go to an Ivy League school and always felt like a, an outsider in the establishment uh, circles. I, I worked with Frosty for, for years and years on Sunday morning telly, and I can't really, uh, I'm not sure I can take, he doesn't quite have the, the quivering lower lip of Frost, and he <laughs> doesn't quite do the, uh, hello, good evening, and welcome, that uh, Frosty used to do so brilliantly for, for the decades. But Frank Langella is, is greater. Who do you prefer as Nixon, Frank Langella or Anthony Hopkins? I, I don't think either of them quite nailed it. The, the problem with doing Nixon is you tend to overemphasize the voice and get caught up in sort of a nightclub yeah. impersonation yeah. act. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Nixon was such a strange figure, a, you know, a hunched figure with a very distinctive voice. Right, yeah. Now let's get, get back to the fictional presidents, because this is President uh, Andrew Shepard. Uh, by a guy, uh, by, by an actor who's always given the impression that he actually uh, takes himself seriously enough to want to be president. So, um, uh, you know, Michael Douglas, one of the most famous Hollywood liberals, son of Kirk Douglas, who's, uh, you know, a very prominent liberal. His and who's in Seven Days in May. Uh, yeah, and Kirk Douglas personally broke the, the blacklist against uh, Donald Trumbo by hiring him to write uh, Spartacus. So, uh, you know, long liberal lineage here and in this uh, Aaron Sorkin movie, The American President, which came out right when liberals were starting to get disappointed with Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. uh, they thought he was triangulating too much. He was tacking toward the center in, in an effort to get reelected, which he, he did, of course, do uh, after signing a welfare reform bill and, you know, cracking down on crime. Yeah. Uh, the climactic speech of The American President is, you know, the liberal wish list the knee plus ultra of right. you know, liberal speechifying. And you know, the, the assumption of this is, if only someone would stand up for liberalism, then the American people would, would stand up and yep. cheer. Yeah, and this is, this is Michael Douglas doing Bill Clinton the way Hollywood wanted him to be. For the last couple of months, Senator Rumson has suggested that being president of this country was to a certain extent about character. And although I have not been willing to engage in his attacks on me, I've been here three years and three days, and I can tell you without hesitation, being president of this country is entirely about character. And Senator Rumson that he refers to there is the almost uh, comical Republican villain played by Richard Dreyfuss. Yeah, and he played, I think, Dick Cheney in the George W. Bush movie that Oliver yeah. Stone did. Yeah, uh, Dreyfuss, of course, a major Hollywood liberal. So this he, he, he's a big fan of my book, actually, in fairness to Richard Dreyfuss. He's, <laughs> well, uh, he's open-minded on something. Right. He has some good taste. Mm. So this speech begins with the, the president declaring to the press, 
Uh, I'm a card-carrying member of the ACLU, which was considered a pretty uh, yeah. dicey thing to say. Yeah. And he progresses through this long list of things, yeah. and finally he says, you know, his idea for a crime bill, instead of a crime bill, he's gonna have a gun control bill. And he says, I'm personally gonna go door to door to get the, the assault weapons and the right. handguns. Right. He, he wants to ban handguns in the United yeah. States of America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's lunacy. Yeah, and Aaron Sorkin thinks, if only Bill Clinton did this, we would have a 49 state landslide. <laughs> and what's interesting, you said this is how they would, how Hollywood liberals wanted Bill Clinton to be in the 90s. One of the interesting aspects of uh, these 90s presidential films is that they uh, find ways, it's not just that it's the Bill they want what, to be, the Bill Clinton they want, uh, it's also the Hillary Clinton they want, because in these movies, she's generally six foot under. Um, in The American <laughs> President, Michael Douglas is a widower. In uh, Independence Day, Bill Pullman is the president, and the, just about the first thing the space aliens do is zap the Hillary Clinton <laughs> figure into, uh, you know, two zillion pieces. Uh, I, I, as we look back on things now, in, in the 90s, uh, Hollywood uh, seemed to think that Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton's problems went away once he was liberated from Hillary and he was a, a nice sympathetic widower like Michael Douglas here. Yeah, the, the, the thing that to me was great as a conservative about Bill Clinton was that he had no backbone whatsoever. I mean, which, he was just a weather vane. Whichever way the wind was blowing, he was quite content to go that way. He just, he just wanted to be popular. If welfare reform was popular, then Bill Clinton's going to go that way. And, uh, and for Hollywood, Bill Clinton, as much as they liked him, was an insufficient figure, and that's why they, they had to upgrade him in these movies. Yeah, there, there's, there's no one in these movies who you would say, well, that's definitely Bill Clinton, because he, he clearly was a disappointment to Hollywood. But, you know, Aaron Sorkin took the American president and, and made that the template for the West Wing, which it was like eight years of, of, you know, what if Bill Clinton were a man of principle? What if Bill Clinton yeah. stood up for uh, liberal ideals? And, uh, you know, it's, it's just week after week of propaganda. It's a speechifying, uh, you know, in every episode. Let's have, a, let's have a final look at a rather different kind of uh, presidential movie. Um, this is a, a, a comedy uh, with, uh, with two presidents, Jack Lemmon and James Garner. What's this film called? My Fellow Americans. My Fellow Americans. 1996, I think. Okay, let's take a look at it. What do you miss most about the office? I don't miss anything. I don't live in the past. But Rita, what about Rita? Oh, God, Rita, yes, I do miss Rita. The greatest cook the White House ever had. The only cook the White House ever had. I think Rita started with George Washington. I don't know that I could stick a Jack Lemmon State of the Union, but I would love to see a James Garner. So he would have been such a cool president, or, James or, Garner. Or even better, Walter Matthau, who was supposed to do that role, but he was ill at the time. <laughs> yeah. I would love to see a cantankerous... Uh, Walter Matthau behind the podium just lecturing people, like, like Ed Koch used to be. Okay. Maybe we're going to get some of that uh, in the next uh, four years. Okay, well, th thanks for uh, reminding us of uh, some of these fictional uh, presidents. Uh, Carl, Pre President Frederick March, President James Garner, I wish, I wish. Uh, in a sense, every real president becomes a fictional president because he becomes the stuff of fiction. Uh, George W. Bush enraged novelists to the point that they wrote entire books fantasizing about killing him. Um, his predecessor inspired at least one author to write an account of the Clinton years as told by his penis. Uh, so we're going to explore the intersection of culture and politics with my next guest.